Hi everybody. Today we're going to do a little video on cellular respiration. We're really going to focus on an overview of what's going on as opposed to uh, digging too far into the details. So what you're going to see is uh, some drawing in this area here, uh, as well as some cutaways to animations that I think will be helpful as well. So let's get started. So let's just start with the biggest picture overview that we can handle. So for cellular respiration, uh, we're looking at the process of breaking down glucose into carbon dioxide and water, and uh, also harnessing some energy along the way. So the process looks like this. We start with glucose, which is C6H12O6. We react it with uh, six molecules of oxygen, and the products are six molecules of water and six molecules of carbon dioxide. So this is the overall equation for cellular respiration. This is super big picture. Um, you know, don't be surprised if uh, it gets a little more complicated than this. All right, but that's where we're going to start, and now it's time to start breaking it down a little further. What we're going to try to do, uh, because this is an overview video, is just start with glucose and look at the things that happen to glucose as we proceed through this multi-stage process, and also see what other reactions are coupled to the breakdown of glucose all along the way. Uh, so here we go. Let's start with the process of glycolysis, which means sugar breaking. So we'll start with glycolysis right down here. Okay, so here comes glycolysis. We're starting with our sugar. We're going to be using one molecule of glucose for this whole process. So we've started with our glucose. Here it is, C6H12O6, that's our glucose. Uh, in the process of glycolysis, we're going to be modifying this glucose uh, over a series of steps, each step which is catalyzed by an enzyme. The result of all of this is that we're going to end up with two molecules of a three carbon molecule called uh, pyruvate, which is C3H4O3. Let's label these because they're super important. So this is our glucose, it's our starting material, and then by the end of glycolysis we have pyruvate. Perfect. So how do we get from glucose to pyruvate? Well, if we like we can switch to an animation here and get a sort of a sense for how this works. So we can take a look at this with this animation. Uh, so we've got four enzymes here, one, two, three, and four, and you'll notice each enzyme has a differently shaped active site here. And remember the active site is where the substrate binds for the reaction to occur. So here we go, here comes in the substrate, there's our substrate. So substrate one matches the active site for enzyme one, it's going to slot right in there, it gets its shape changed, now it's the right shape for enzyme two, enzyme two alters it further, uh, now it's the right shape for enzyme 3, enzyme 3 alters it further, now it's the right shape for enzyme 4, enzyme 4 alters it further, and then you have the final product right here. So this is basically what's happening in glycolysis as well. You're starting with glucose, it's being modified, broken down with a series of enzymes over time. Uh, and we can look at that in a bit more detail with this animation here. Uh, so this animation, if you watch your glucose over here, here comes uh, all these modifications. So the glucose is being modified step by step. Some ATP came in and added a phosphate group. Here's another ATP adding another phosphate group. The thing then splits in half. Uh, there's then what's called an isomerization. And we now have two of this G3P molecule. We add another phosphate group and we get some NADH. We'll talk more about that in a moment. We now pull that phosphate back off and we get ATP. There's a rearranging of the phosphate. Uh, production of water, another ATP is formed, and there we go, we end up with pyruvic acid, which is also known as pyruvate. So that's the process of glycolysis. Let's go back to the drawing board and summarize this. Okay, so just as you saw before, we're starting with glucose, we're doing a series of enzyme-mediated reactions and producing pyruvate. But along the way, some very important products are produced. So let's take a look at those. So one of the things that we're producing is ATP, and for each molecule of glucose, ooh, let's try that again, for each molecule of glucose, we get two molecules of ATP. So this is the first time 
so far, we've seen ATP produced by this process. So in order to make 2 ATP, we need an input of 2 ADP and 2 phosphate. So ADP, adenosine diphosphate, plus 2 phosphate gives you 2 adenosine triphosphate molecules. Uh, and we draw this curvy arrow sort of tangent to this line to indicate that this reaction in pink is coupled to this reaction in yellow. In other words, they, they're happening at the same time. Um, so we've, we've made 2 ATP, we've made 2 pyruvate, and we're also going, let me scroll down a bit, there we go, we're also going to make uh, two molecules called NADH. And we're going to make that NADH from a starting molecule called NAD+. Okay, so this is glycolysis right here. And if you have uh, oxygen present, then you're going to go on and do the Krebs cycle, and then later the electron transport chain, and then use the uh, enzyme complex ATP synthase to make a whole ton of ATP. But if you don't have oxygen, then the path gets a little simpler. So let's follow the path for no oxygen, the anaerobic path, and then we'll look at the aerobic path, the one that proceeds with oxygen. So right now we're going to look at the uh, anaerobic path, the one that occurs without oxygen. That's what we'll look at right now. So this pyruvate uh, is going to be altered and broken down uh, without a, a gain of energy. And uh, so the reason we need to do this is because if we have no oxygen, glycolysis is all we can do. Now, this may be okay depending on the organism, or even if it's something like us, it may be okay temporarily. Now, because glycolysis does produce some ATP, not very much per molecule of glucose, but some ATP. Uh, however, we can't keep doing glycolysis forever because in order to continue doing the reaction, we need to continue supplying the reactants. Well, glucose, that's fine. We'll have plenty of glucose available. Uh, ADP and phosphate, we'll have plenty of those because we'll keep using up the ATP and regenerating those. But the NAD+, we're not going to have any of that if all we're doing is glycolysis. We're going to use it up pretty quickly and make NADH. So the process we're looking at right now, which is called fermentation, is really essentially a process for converting NADH back into NAD+, so that glycolysis can continue. Let me say that again because it's really important. Fermentation can be thought of as a process for converting NADH back to NAD+, so that glycolysis can continue. All right, let's look at that in slightly more detail. So we're taking our pyruvate, and I'll draw the reaction sort of going backwards like this. And so this NADH is being reacted with the pyruvate to make NAD+. And so we've regenerated our NAD+, glycolysis can occur. And then what are the ultimate products of fermentation? The ultimate products actually depend on what type of organism you are. Uh, but there are two possible uh, common outcomes for fermentation. Uh, one, if you're a human like me and you, then you will do lactic acid fermentation. So lactic acid fermentation. So your end product will be lactic acid. This is the stuff that makes your muscles burn uh, when you're working out. If you are, let's say, a yeast, then the two products of your fermentation will be ethanol. That's common drinking alcohol. We also use it to sanitize the benches sometimes. And carbon dioxide. So if you're a human, you make lactic acid in, during the process where you regenerate NAD+. And if you're a yeast or something, uh, then you make ethanol and CO2. And, and this outcome for fermentation is really the basis for all of our brewing of alcoholic drinks and, and things like that. Uh, so again, this is the process of fermentation. Let's label this. Uh, this is the process of fermentation. And the point of fermentation is to, uh, my camera's in the way, is to regenerate NAD plus so you can keep doing glycolysis and you can make ATP even when you don't have oxygen. So just to be clear, this is when you have no oxygen. I'm breaking the rule of unsaturated colors so that I can really make this stand out. Okay, so that's if you have no oxygen. If you have no oxygen, you start with glucose, you make a little bit of ATP, you get pyruvate, and then you have to break down that pyruvate uh, to regenerate your NAD+, so you can keep doing glycolysis. You also end up with these waste products, lactic acid, ethanol, and CO2, which need to be cleared from the organism uh, or they will be uh, poisoned and die. That's actually why when you're brewing beer or wine, uh, it can only get up to about, I think it's like 12, 13, 14% alcohol. Um, that's, that's the maximum uh, before the yeast die. So 
So there are other ways to increase the concentration through distillation, but if you're just using fermentation uh, with the yeast, then, then that's the maximum. So now, let's ask, uh, we, we've made our, our pyruvate with glycolysis. Let's say that actually there is oxygen available. Okay, so let's imagine that uh, actually you do have oxygen. You have oxygen, everything's great, you're, you're breathing well, you're not suffocating, there's plenty of oxygen. So there you go, oxygen, check mark. Uh, so now what do you do? Now we move into the mitochondria, those organelles that are specialized for harnessing the energy of glucose, and we do a process called the Krebs cycle. And the Krebs cycle is, like glycolysis, a process of uh, systematically breaking down a molecule to extract energy from it. Just like glycolysis, it's mediated by a whole bunch of enzymes. Um, just like glycolysis, it has specific inputs and outputs. So for the Krebs cycle, we're going to start with two molecules of pyruvate. Remember, this is the two molecules of pyruvate that we produced from one molecule of glucose. And what we're going to end up with is six molecules of carbon dioxide. And that's the six molecules of carbon dioxide that you may recognize from the cellular respiration formula, glucose plus oxygen yields CO2 plus water. Uh, along the way, we're going to get some specific uh, outputs from the coupled reactions. So we're going to get some ATP here as well. So we'll get two molecules of ATP per glucose. So that's one per pyruvate. So that's two ADP plus two phosphate yield two ATP. So there's two more from the Krebs cycle. And uh, we're also going to get some more of those energy-carrying NADH molecules. We haven't talked too much about these yet, uh, but they'll become really important in the next step. So we'll get some more NADH, and specifically, starting with pyruvate, we'll get 8 NAD plus and 8 NADH. That's for 2 pyruvate. And that's also including a step where pyruvate is converted to a molecule called acetyl-CoA, which we're sort of glossing over at this point. Uh, and finally, we're going to produce two molecules of a substance called FADH2, which is similar to NADH. So 2FADH2. Okay? And this whole process here, remember, is called the Krebs cycle. Sometimes you'll see this called the citric acid cycle as well, or sometimes the citrate cycle. Uh, there are a number of different names. But uh, this is what we're looking at. We're producing CO2, and along the way, we're uh, making some ATP, and we're also producing these molecules NADH and FADH2, which you can think of as sort of charged up portable battery molecules. And you'll see what they power later is uh, the massive generation of ATP. Uh, now, if we go back to our animation, here's our animation for the Krebs cycle. And uh, what I hope you will see is if the animation begins, There we go. Okay, great. I was just having some trouble. But now, there we go. Okay, great. So uh, here what we have is the Krebs cycle in all its glorious detail. So what we're looking at here on the left is the sequence of reactions that occurs to break pyruvate down and release carbon dioxide, and in the process, generate these molecules NADH. Here's NADH again here. Um, we're generating some ATP as well. We're generating some FADH2 as well. So just like before, this is a sequence of chemical reactions. Each reaction, each of these transformations you're seeing on the right, is mediated by an enzyme that speeds up the rate of reaction by lowering the activation energy. And uh, at the end, what you're accumulating are these molecules of NADH, some ATP, and some FADH2. You're also, of course, producing some uh, carbon dioxide. Now, the numbers lifted, listed here are for one pyruvate. We're looking at it for two, so it'll be double all of those amounts. So let's come back and uh, make sure we've got it. So the Krebs cycle is essentially, as you saw there, it's a lot more complicated than, than what we're listing here, but this is, this is it in terms of inputs and outputs. We're starting with pyruvate. If we have oxygen, Right? We have oxygen here, so we're going forward. If we didn't have oxygen, we'd do fermentation. We have oxygen. 
we're making six molecules of CO2, some ATP, some NADH, and some FADH2. So keep in mind, the inputs here are pyruvate, ADP and phosphate, NAD+, and FAD. If you don't have even one of these inputs, the process won't happen. Keep that in mind. Uh, and then your output here as a waste product is your CO2. This is the stuff whew, that you are exhaling. Okay, so right now, per molecule of glucose, we have accumulated uh, two ATP from glycolysis, and we've accumulated two ATP from the Krebs cycle. It's really not all that much. This wouldn't be enough to keep you alive. Uh, I think the figure is the amount of ATP, let's say, in an average heart muscle cell, would be depleted in about six seconds uh, if you weren't able to replace it. And this isn't going to replace it at a fast enough rate. So pretty quickly, your heart muscles would, would no longer be able to contract, you wouldn't be able to pump blood around your body, and you would die. So this can't be the end of the story, and it is not the end of the story. In fact, what we really need to look at is what happens to these molecules NADH and FADH2, because these are the molecules that contain most of the energy which was originally stored in the glucose. And so now it's about figuring out what happens to that energy and how it's used to make a great abundance of ATP. So let's look at that together now. So we finished the Krebs cycle, we're now interested in NADH and FADH2. So these are the stars of our show moving on. So NADH, NA, NADH, 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 there we go, and FADH2. So this is the stuff that's actually going to move on. So the CO2 is done, this is a waste product, it's gone. Oops. Now we're really interested in the FAD. H2 and the NADH. So this is what's actually going to carry forward for us. Uh, and so now where we're going to is the uh, inner mitochondrial membrane. So let's draw a nice membrane structure here. By the way, in this, in this video, we're going to take a look at the sort of geography of all these processes right at the end. So if you're a little confused about, well, where's glycolysis? Where's fermentation happening? Where's the Krebs cycle happening? Don't worry. Uh, we'll take a look at that all together at the end. And that'll serve as a nice review as well. So we've got our NADH and our FADH2. It looks like we're going to have to squeeze it into this space here. I think that'll be just fine. So let's draw a nice membrane here. So here will be, this will be our nice uh, inner mitochondrial membrane. So remember this thing is made up of uh, phospholipids. Let's, can we actually draw the phospholipids? That might be nice. So let's see. I'm not going to draw all of them, but I think, I think I can probably make this work for us. Check it out. All right, I'm going to do some real fancy stuff here. You're going to be like, whoa, and I'm going to be like, whoa, if this works. If it doesn't work, I'm just going to cut this out. Uh, okay, all right, so then I'm going to take this like this, you see? I'm going to copy it like that, right, and then I'm going to go like this. Is it working? Kind of. Looks like ramen noodles. Great, perfect, <laughs> flawless. So this is our inner mitochondrial membrane. This is our phospholipid bilayer. Remember the phosphate heads, the nonpolar hydrophobic fatty acid tails in the middle, creating a nonpolar barrier that charged particles can't cross. Now, embedded in this membrane, there are a number of proteins. So let's draw our proteins. Um, I won't be paying too much attention to uh, where they are, or what their shapes are, or, or that sort of thing, but we'll just get a, a couple of proteins in here. So there's a nice protein. And we'll draw another one like this. And we'll draw another one like this. And that'll be great. And then over here, uh, we will have our ATP synthase, which will be of great importance. Let's even give ATP synthase a different color because it, it's really sort of a, a separate process. So here's the bulb or the knob of ATP synthase. And then uh, this will be the piece that goes through the membrane. There we go. Okay, so this will be our ATP synthase. And uh, this portion here will be our electron transport chain. And you'll see why it is called an electron transport chain in just a moment. And we'll also look at a nice animation together. It'll be our electron transport chain. Okay, so this is our electron transport chain. I'm actually going to uh, 
yeah, get rid of this because we're going to need this space up here. So just keep in mind, this down here, this is our electron transport chain, okay? I'll draw an arrow. There we go. It's our electron transport chain. We'll abbreviate it ETC. So these electron carrying uh, molecules, well, this NADH, this FADH2, this stuff comes in and is used in this electron transport chain to pump protons across the membrane. So let's take a look at that in a little more detail. So our FADH2 and our NADH are going to be used here. So our NADH is going to drop off some electrons here, forming NAD+. And our FADH2 is going to drop off some electrons here, forming FAD. So as it drops off these electrons, we'll draw these electrons in red. Okay, those are, those are our electrons, draw a little minus sign, right? So dropping off these electrons, these electrons are going to be uh, shuttled from protein to protein across this electron transport chain. And where they're eventually going to end up is with oxygen. So oxygen is going to come in here at the end of the electron transport chain. We're going to have four protons plus two molecules of oxygen and, oh, sorry, just one molecule of oxygen. And uh, it's going to combine with these electrons and we're going to get water. And this is the water part of that general cellular respiration equation of glucose plus oxygen yields carbon dioxide and water. Here's the water. Okay, so as the electrons get shuttled along the, the electron transport chain, a really important process occurs. And that really important process is that protons or hydrogen ions are pumped across the membrane. So our, our hydrogen ions are pumped across the membrane. What's a color that'll stand out here? How about a nice blue? So there we go. So hydrogen ions get pumped across the membrane. We'll just draw these as uh, plus signs like this. Okay. Whoops, wrong button. Try again. There we go. Okay, great. So we're pumping these protons across the membrane, and what we're ending up with is a concentration gradient. Now, you may remember this when you studied uh, diffusion and osmosis. Concentration gradient is just when you have more of something on one side of a barrier than you have on the other side of a barrier. And so the whole point of the electron transport chain is just to generate this gradient, this um, unequal distribution of protons where there's more on one side of the membrane than the other side of the membrane. So we've got this proton gradient up here, and that's the whole point of the electron transport chain. It's to generate this proton gradient. That's all cramped. Can I do better? Probably. What if we just scroll up slightly? Boom! Innovations. It's to generate this proton gradient. So now we've got this unequal distribution of protons. You might remember from studying diffusion that uh, if you have a concentration gradient across a barrier and molecules are permitted to cross the barrier, they'll tend to move from an area of high concentration, that's up here in the membrane, to an area of low concentration, that's down here. And so what's going to happen is these protons are, are, are going to tend to cross back over. However, remember our phospholipid bilayer does not permit charged particles to uh, cross, they would need a channel for that, uh, and they do have a channel, and that channel is a molecule called ATP synthase. So these protons actually can cross back down, and so we'll have some protons down here as well. And as they cross, they actually trigger a, a pretty amazing process in the ATP synthase, which is that they trigger a uh, rotation, a physical mechanical rotation. This is not you know purely theoretical or whatever, this has been observed. Um, they actually trigger a rotation of this knob here at the end. And we'll, we'll take a look at a cool animation of this in just a moment. As this knob spins, there is a reaction that occurs between ADP and phosphate. So we end up with, uh, again, ADP and phosphate. And this ADP and phosphate forms ATP. And so for every, what did we, we ended up with 10 NADH total, two from glycolysis, eight from the Krebs cycle, and two FADH2. When we use all of those in the electron transport chain, make the proton gradient, and then it flows back down here through ATP synthase, we make uh, about 30 ATP. So combine that with the 2 ATP from the Krebs cycle and the 2 ATP from glycolysis, and we're ending up with something about 34, 36, depending on how you count uh, ATP per molecule of glucose. And this, this process right here, is what is keeping you alive right now. Any disruption to this process right here for um, 
more than a little while is going to cause you to die. So oxygen deprivation, removing this final electron acceptor of oxygen, that will certainly kill you. Interfering with the uh, oxygen picking up electrons here, that would certainly kill you. Uh, blocking any of these enzymes so that they can't transfer electrons or perhaps they can't uh, pull electrons off of the NAD+, or they can't pump protons, that would certainly kill you. Um, Destroying the proton gradient would probably also kill you unless you could you could really burn a lot of glucose Maybe that you'd be okay then um, But basically if you if you tinker with any of these processes, you're gonna be in bad shape uh, Okay, so let's take a quick look at the uh, ATP synthase in action and the electron transport chain in action So here's our electron transport chain right here. Uh, you can see it's similar to how I've drawn it. We've got different proteins moving electrons back and forth and we've got a proton gradient that's being established. Watch, see those protons being pumped across. You can look for some others, there you go, being pumped across. Then you can see them flowing down through the ATP synthase. They're literally turning a wheel. And as that wheel turns, uh, a shaft turns down here in this area, which is called the catalytic knob, actually changes its shape. And as it changes its shape, there you go, it squeezes together ADP and phosphate to make ATP. And so this is the process by which these charged up electron carrying molecules, NADH and FADH2, uh, use their energy, which was originally the energy of glucose, to create a pro proton gradient. And then the energy stored in that proton gradient is used uh, as the protons flow back across the membrane to power this little molecular machine, ATP synthase, to make ATP. And then that's the ATP that's gonna power every chemical reaction in your body from copying DNA, to building proteins, to contracting your muscles, to resetting your neurons so that you can think. All right, so that's the, the big picture synopsis. Let's look at a, a neat animation of ATP synthase just because it's pretty cool. And uh, then that'll be just about it. Maybe there'll be a, a couple extra thoughts as well. So let's look at that. Okay, and we're back. So this is a really nice molecular model animation of ATP synthase. So in this case, the proton gradient is being established so that there's a high concentration down here and a low concentration up here. This is the piece of ATP synthase which is uh, embedded in the membrane. So this gray stuff, that's, that's your uh, phospholipid bilayer. And then here, this is our catalytic knob. This is the thing where the pieces are smushing together the ADP and the phosphate. Okay, so let's just take a look and uh, see what we can see. Okay, so here we go. Animation starting. Uh, the protons flowing are not pictured, but you can see the rotation of this element here. Uh, and you can see, right, the, the different little orbs. These are different uh, atoms. And we actually know the structure of this molecule quite well. So now we're looking at the catalytic knob, and we can see the ADP and the phosphate. And then you can see how uh, the structure moves to facilitate the putting together of these molecules. I think we'll see that again uh, over here. Or ah, we'll see it here again. So there you go, the ADP and the phosphate. As this shaft moves, uh, it sort of squeezes them together. Uh, and what they're showing now is that the enzyme can also work in reverse, though that's not uh, particularly interesting to us. Um, so you, you can run the thing backwards, uh, but again, we don't care so much about that. Um, this is, this is uh, even in greater detail, so there's like ADP coming in. These are these are molecules from the rest of the uh, enzyme that is sort of showing how the catalysis actually occurs. Um, and and you can see what's happening here is basically here's our ADP, uh, and and then um, it's coming together here. New bonds are forming, and this is facilitating the the um, new bonds which you're making between the extra phosphate and the ADP. So this is perhaps a little outside the scope of what we're doing, but what you can see actually is that the enzyme really actually physically moves around the molecules to strain certain bonds so they're more likely to break and to bring other atoms closer together so they're more likely to form bonds. And that's really the magic of enzymes. It's just increasing the likelihood that reactions will occur by making some bonds more likely to break and some bonds more likely to form. And so that's our, our ATP synthase in action uh, it really is a pretty complex machine, and uh, you've got trillions of trillions of them in your body working all the time. And if you didn't, uh, you'd be quite dead. Okay, cool. So we're back here. Uh, here's the overview again. Remember, any time you're doing any process here, you need all your inputs to be available. So if you run out of glucose, 
you're done. There's nothing. Nothing's going to happen. If you want to do glycolysis, you need glucose, you need ADP and phosphate, you need NAD+. That NAD+, is a real sticking point. We either need to do fermentation, uh, if there's no oxygen, to regenerate that NAD+, or if there's uh, the Krebs cycle and electron transport going on, then we'll be regenerating these as well and we'll be just fine. Uh, once you've done glycolysis, and let's assume you do have oxygen, then you can do the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle is generating more ATP, uh, more NADH, more FADH2. Remember, you still need these inputs, NAD plus FAD, in addition to the pyruvate. Um, note, by the way, this thing is just saying you need oxygen to proceed in this direction. Oxygen is not a part of the Krebs cycle. Uh, you're producing CO2. And then where do these inputs come from? Well, they are also regenerated by the electron transport chain. So if the electron transport chain is working, then you regenerate the reactants required for this process right here. Uh, if the electron transport chain is broken, don't be surprised to find that the Krebs cycle breaks down uh, because you're no longer supplying these reactants right here. If your Krebs cycle is working well, your electron transport chain is working well, you're producing these energy carrying NADH and FADH2 molecules. These molecules are dropping off their cargo of electrons here at the electron transport chain. As these electrons are shuttled to the final electron acceptor, which is oxygen, protons are pumped across a gradient, uh, across a membrane, forming a gradient. This gradient uh, causes the tendency of these protons to flow back across the membrane through an enzyme complex called ATP synthase. As the protons flow, ATP synthase starts spinning around. As it spins, it combines ADP and phosphate to form ATP. And this is where the majority of the energy that powers all your various reactions comes from. So. This is it, cellular respiration. I hope this was helpful. Good luck.